Hello again everybody, so we're back to talk about uh, Cenozoic Earth history and now we're on to the Quaternary. Now before we go any further, let's just take a second and discuss the code word of this particular lecture. The code word of this particular lecture is going to be Africa, as in the continent, I repeat, Africa. Okay, so now let's look at what was happening in the Quaternary. Oh, that didn't quite work. There, that did work. Okay. So the Quaternary period extends from 2.6 million years ago to the present day, so it's pretty short. And it consists of two epochs, the Pleistocene, which is about 2.6 to, well, pretty much uh, well, 11,700 years ago, and the Holocene, which starts uh, 11,700 years ago to the present day. So the Holocene, I think we can agree, is tiny, geologically speaking. So now there have been some discussions about actually splitting the Holocene up or maybe actually starting a new epoch altogether. Now the reason for that is, is that it's been suggested probably quite rightly in that human beings have had a very major effect on life on Earth. I mean, let's be honest, you know, the most recent mass, mass extinction is happening right now because, you know, we're killing up, we're leading to the death of so many different species that from a geologic point of view, we're actually causing a mass extinction at the moment. So if you look in the rock record in like, you know, 10 million years, you will see a period where many species died in a very, very short period of time, geologically speaking. So, you know, that would be a logical place to put in a boundary. And so it has been suggested that maybe the Holocene should come to an end and maybe it should be replaced by a new boundary and we should have a new epoch which would be called the Anthropocene. Okay. Now, obviously, we have some problems. So it's kind of like, well, where would you put this boundary? What would you use as the, you know, the, the boundary itself? So there have been a, a few discussions about what we could possibly use. So one of them would be the start of the Industrial Revolution. So obviously we would see significant changes in the environment once we started burning fossil fuels in very, very large concentrations. The other one is maybe something like antiquity. So about 2,000 years ago, you know, that's when we start seeing the first appearance of you know, major civilizations. And most importantly, we really start seeing the, you know, the practice of you know, really very, very large you know, uh, farming as well taking place. And then we have the first occurrence of farming itself around 8,000 years ago. Maybe that would be a good boundary to go for. So in that case, what we're going to see is we're going to see a sudden change in the vegetation in areas, aren't we? We're going to see the loss of trees as they're cleared for farmland. And then we're going to see the pollen, for instance, from trees being replaced by the pollen from grasses. And, you know, for instance, like wheat. So, you know... There are several possible you know, reasons where you, you know, several possible places, should I say, where you can put the boundary. And so this is something that's been discussed for a while. And then in July the 18th, something slightly unexpected happened. So what happened is, is the IUGS, who are kind of the, you know, the holders of the geologic timescale, they're in charge of it, rather suddenly went and split the Holocene into three ages. And this kind of caught everyone off guard. So, you know, everyone was talking about, you know, maybe we should start a new epoch, maybe we should start a new age, something like that. And then all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, the IUGS actually splits up the Holocene. And so what does it split it up into? Well, it splits it up into, first of all, if we look over here, the Greenlandian. And that's marked by the end of the last ice age. That's when the Greenlandian begins. Now, the Greenlandian ends when it transitions into the North Grippian, and that's marked by glacial melting, which led to an increase in fresh water entering the oceans, leading to a disruption in ocean circulation. So we begin to see that in the form of, you know, changes in sea you know, rocks that we can see, but also changes in the, in the fossils we can see. And then finally, the uh, North Grippian transfers into the uh, Megalohanian. And this is marked by a major change in climate, leading to drought and significant problems for ancient civilizations. So, as you can see, the, you know, it has been split up based on you know, logical boundaries, but it did rather catch everyone off guard. You know, and obviously led to a, you know, 
in, a, in a geology sense, a bit of an argument. So in terms of the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene epoch, so 11,700 years ago, it's defined by the start of warmer conditions associated with the, with, uh, the melting of the most recent continental glaciers. So around 12,000 years ago, we begin to see a bit of an increase in global temperatures. So this is reflected in geology by the sudden increase in the amount of deposition of glacial till. So if you remember, glacial till is the sediment deposited at the front of a glacier. So it's a glacial sediment. Obviously, when glaciers start retreating, we see more glacial till forming. Two, we see the movement of temperate regions northwards. So as the ice sheets, both at the north and south, get smaller, well, that means all of a sudden the temperate regions, so you know the, the regions where we have you know uh, warm, wet, warm springs and summers, and slightly cooler uh, falls and winters, well, that region suddenly starts to move northwards because you know the the area which was which was covered in ice is now disappearing, and so the temperate zone can now start to move northwards, and the same thing will happen with the equatorial region. That too can start to move northwards. We obviously see changes in vegetation and pollen. That's not a huge shock, is it? You know, as, as these areas which were covered in ice begin to, you know, expose the ground underneath, obviously we'll see the steady appearance of things like grasses and then eventually trees and, you know, you'll in theory set up, you know, quite nice woodland eventually. And finally, we're going to see changes in the oxygen isotope ratio of marine shelly organisms. Well, why is that? Well, gra glaciers begin actually lock up the isotope of oxygen which we call oxygen 16 in quite large quantities so because glaciers contain water which has large concentrations of oxygen 16 in it that means that when the glaciers start melting and that water is released and allowed to return to the oceans we suddenly see an increase in the amount of oxygen 16 in seawater now, we obviously can't measure the seawater, but what we can measure is we can measure the shells of the animals which were living in that new seawater, can't we? And th those shells are going to have an oxygen isotope ratio, which essentially is simple, which matches the water in which they live in. So when the amount of oxygen 16 goes up, the shells have greater amounts of oxygen 16 in them. When the amount of oxygen 18 goes up, the shells have you know higher amounts of oxygen 18 in them so you know all we have to do is measure the shells look at the oxygen isotopes in them and that's going to tell us you know you know how much fresh water was or wasn't going into the ocean so it's quite a useful tool for a geologist now the one thing i will say is that means obviously the shells themselves that we're dealing with here cannot you know have been you know uh, cannot have been uh, altered in any way and it also means they can't really have been exposed to very, very high temperatures. So this means, we, you know, we can't use shells from, you know, let's say the, uh, the, the Triassic, you know, which have been, which have been quite heavily you know, fossilized because obviously those shells will have been, you know, reworked quite significantly and the oxygen isotopes in those shells will be, you know, nothing like the oxygen isotopes when the shell first formed. So the Pleistocene itself is often referred to as the Ice Age. So during this period, we have extensive ice sheets. They're going to cover much of North America, Europe, and Northeastern Asia. And essentially, it's typically above a latitude of 45 degrees. That's where we have all this ice. So the Pleistocene is marked by extensive till deposits. Remember, till is that glacial sediment. We also see polished and striated bedrock and U-shaped valleys. So the type of glaciers that we get in mountains, they're called alpine glaciers. When they move down a mountain valley, they will erode that mountain valley and they will produce very, very flat sides to the mountain valley and a flat and a flat bottom. And so that means if you look at the, you know, take a section through the, the valley they create, it's got very steep sides, a flat bottom, and very steep side again so it looks like the letter u so it's called a u-shaped valley and that's an indication that you know you've had an alpine glacier moving down this mountain valley so once the alpine glacier melts away you're just left with this u-shaped valley now in terms of the polished and striated bedrock what's causing that 
Well, that's purely because as your glacier moves through the area, your glacier is essentially a giant bulldozer. Vegetation, soil, it all gets stripped off, gets taken away. And so your glacier moves along the bedrock, which is the stuff underlying the soil. Okay. So as your glacier moves along the bedrock, that's, that polishes the bedrock. So why does it polish it? Well, in the bottom of the glacial ice, there are lots and lots of small fragments of rock. And those small fragments of rock are like a very, very fine sandpaper. And they're going to slowly polish the bedrock so the bedrock becomes very, very smooth. So that's polishing. Now, also in the bottom of this glacial ice, there's going to be slightly larger pieces of rock. So I think kind of, you know, cobble-sized pieces of rock. Now, those pieces of rock aren't going to polish the bedrock, are they? Instead, they're going to cut, they're going to grind deep grooves into that bedrock. We refer to these grooves as striations. So, glacial, so when a glacier moves through an area, number one, we will see till deposits, and the, and the glacier will also polish the rock it moves over, and it will leave behind striations on that polished rock. If the glacier is a you know, alpine glacier, so essentially in a mountainous area, it will also leave behind a U-shaped valley. Okay, so there's lots of evidence that we can see of glaciers having moved through an area. So glaciers and ice sheets uh, are moving bodies, so they're like a river essentially. And they'll move by a mixture of both plastic flow, so that's when the ice actually deforms in response to pressure, so it behaves in a ductile fashion and basal slip. That's when essentially the rock essentially the rock behaves as one big solid chunk of ice and it just slides over the ground. Okay. So those are the two ways your glaciers can move. Well, a, not, a glacier will move through those two methods combined, should I say. So glaciers themselves come in three types. So first of all, there's the valley glaciers, also sometimes called the alpine glaciers. And they form these long, narrow bodies of ice which are confined by mountainous terrain either side. So if you've ever seen a mountain glacier, you will know that either side of it there's high ground. So the glacier can't escape. So it's stuck in that river valley. And obviously the glacier will flow from the high point to the low point under gravity. And the glacier itself will move by a mixture of both, of both the basal slip and the plastic flow. Now, the other two types of glacier are the large ones. So here's a valley glacier, as you can see. This valley glacier is constrained by the higher ground either side. It can't get out. So in terms of the other two types of glaciers, we have continental glaciers and ice caps. So a continental glacier is a glacier which covers an area of at least 50,000 square kilometers. Now, they are unconfined by topography, which means they go wherever they want. Now, they will typically flow out from a central point or points. So there'll be a starting point, essentially, where the glacier starts building and it just goes out from there. Now, in terms of continental glaciers, the flow is, pri is primarily plastic, with basal slip being a minor component. Now, the reason for that is, is that this ice sheet is thick. So it's very, very heavy. So making that very, 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 very heavy ice sheet move is very difficult. So, you know, trying to make it move through basal slip is like trying to, you know, trying to push an elephant. It's just not going to you know, happen easily. So the only way to get the ice to move mostly is through plastic deformation. Make the ice move in a ductile fashion. Now, ice caps are areas of ice which are smaller than 50,000 square kilometers. So very, very often the term ice cap is often used when you should say continental glacier. So, you know, if we look at the two continental glaciers we have now, which is, of course, Antarctica and Greenland, it's not uncommon for people to call them ice caps. But nope, if they do that, point out their mistake, they're actually called continental glaciers. So... During the, Pleistocene, uh, during the Pleistocene, there are actually several episodes of glaciation. So it's, it's not one big build-out of the ice sheet. The ice sheet will move out, then retreat, build out, retreat, build out, retreat. So these periods of retreat and warming are referred to as interglacials. 
or interglacial intervals. And so, once again, this is a period of time when the, gla when, the when the climate warms up a little bit and the glacier retreats for a little while. Now, then the climate gets cooler and the glacier starts to build out again. Now, at their maximum extent, the ice caps covered no more than 30% of the Earth's continental surface. So this wasn't a huge, you know, these weren't huge ice sheets, but they were still pretty big, don't get me wrong. And they were focused almost exclusively in the northern hemisphere. So the southern hemisphere did not have ice sheets of you know, anywhere near the same size. In terms of temperatures, temperatures would have been about 4 to 7 Celsius lower than present. So, you know, you would have noticed the difference in temperature. And the lower temperatures caused the temperate region to move south. So, of course, as the ice moves south, it pushes the temperate region, that region that has, you know, warmer springs and summers and colder falls and winters, it pushes that interval, pushes that region south, doesn't it? So as it pushes that temperate band southwards, well, obviously it's going to start encroaching on the equatorial band, and the equatorial band is going to get thinner in response. So this is what happens when we see, you know, the, the you know the movement of these temperate bands. So what happens is, for instance, is we see the ice comes south, we see the temperate band that you know is in present-day Europe move south, and so we see the temperate band actually sitting over the over the modern-day Sahara. And so all of a sudden we see the Sahara become a temperate region. So we begin to see grasslands and forests in that area. Now the same goes for the south central United States. So we begin to see states like you know Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, all of a sudden suddenly find themselves in the temperate band. And we begin to see the formation of, once again, large amounts of grassland and forested areas. So, okay, so what about those interglacials? Well, how do we actually know they happened? Well, what we do is we analyze things which are called moraines. So moraines are essentially produced by the buildup of material in front of your glacier. Obviously, because remember, your glacier is just dumping material in front of itself. So that material is called till, and it's going to build up a pile. And that pile is called a moraine. And so every time your glacier stops for a little bit, that's your you know, build up the pile of material, which we call a moraine. Now, what we can do through careful analysis of the moraines is we can begin to see, you know, when the glacier was retreat, when the glacier was retreating, or when the glacier was moving forward. And we can analyze this so we can see these periods of glacial retreat and expansion. So, when we look at these interglacials, we actually see that we have quite a few of them okay so oh sorry sh should I say <coughs> excuse me these periods are the uh, glacial and essentially ah, I got myself mixed up there let's try that one again shall we so through the analysis of glacial deposits and moraines we get and the erratic boulders and striations we can determine essentially you know the, gla the, ma the maximum extent of the glaciers and their retreat and their growth and this is how we know that the glaciers in the Pleistocene covered three times more of the Earth's surface than at present. And we know the maximum depth of the ice sheet that covered North, you know, most of North America was about three kilometers. So a, a pretty, you know, pretty thick ice sheet. So in North America, mapping of glacial deposits has revealed several glacial stages. So that's periods of widespread glaciation. That's when the glaciers are moving outwards, they're growing and they're separated by warmer interglacial intervals. So as the mapping of glacial deposits has become more refined, we've managed to add more and more of these stages. Okay, so these stages have been replaced by 11 stages, which are termed pre illinoisian A through K. So these are the stages of glacial expansion. So we've got Illinoisian K down here about 2.6 million years ago. And it goes all the way through to Illinoisian A, about 0.3 million years ago. Then we have the Illinoisian. Then we have the, oh, cripes, I hate pronouncing this one, uh, uh, Sangamonian. And then we have the Wisconsin. So these are periods of glacial expansion. Now, these are very, very small periods of glacial expansion. Okay. 
So this is what's been achieved by looking at these moraines and just analysing them. So now the nice thing about Pleistocene uh, geology is because it's so recent, we can get information from lots of sources that we, we can't when we look at older rocks like rocks from the Permian, for instance. So the initial attempts until the 1960s to constrain the number of glacial events were limited to terrestrial deposits. We had to look at the stuff we had on land. However, if you remember, there is another source of information that we can turn to. And that source of information is the deep marine basins. So if you remember, in these very, very deep marine environments, we have the deposition of what's referred to as pelagic clays. Now, pelagic clays is a buildup of very, very fine material, and it builds up very, very slowly. And most importantly, it does not get eroded. So there's no erosion. So we get a steady buildup of material, but no material is lost, which is great. So what we have is we have a consistent record of what was happening. So within these sediments, we have the shells of animals, single-celled organisms, such as foraminifera and other, you know, single type, you know, and other types of photosynthetic plankton. So, of course, these organisms, they float at the very, very top of the water column, but when they die, their body is decomposed, but the shell they had around them sinks down to the bottom and becomes incorporated into the sediment. So, in the plagic clays, we have these shells. And so, when we look at these deep ocean cores, it actually suggests that there were 20 warm, cold cycles. Remember, we can use the oxygen isotopes to tell us this, okay? When the amount of oxygen-16 goes up, that's a warm period. When the amount of oxygen-16 goes down, that's a cold period. doesn't give us exact numbers of the temperature, but it simply tells us when it was warm and when it was cold. And so what we can do is we can use the, use the core and use the shells in that core to actually look at the uh, Pleistocene, and we actually realise, no, there's not 11 of them, there's 20. So it's helped us to refine exactly, you know, the, how many periods of growth and retreat the glaciers uh, had during the Pleistocene. So in terms of analysing water temperature using shells, well, what can we, what can we do? So foraminifera are a useful species because they have limited conditions of growth. So a foraminifera will only live in certain areas, you know, where the temperature is right. So what other things, though, can we use to actually work out how the, what the water temperature is? So we can infer water temperature from a f one, well, three main variables. Number one, the type of foraminifera. Well, there are hot water foraminifera and there are cold water foraminifera. So depending on what species is present, you can make a, you know, a, a pretty, est pretty good estimate about whether the water was hot or cold. There is the coil direction of the shell. So some species of foraminifera, and I, spe and I uh, stress some, will coil their shells differently depending on the water temperature. So when the water temperature is hot, species A might coil its shell clock uh, might let's try that again might coil its shell clockwise. However, when the weather gets cold, it might coil its shell anticlockwise. And we can see this when we look at the fossils. And then finally, there's the oxygen isotopes we've already spoken about. Okay, so as discussed, temperature is quite straightforward. Uh, certain types of foraminifera will like to live in warmer water, and certain types of foraminifera will like to live in colder water. So if we're looking at an area of the ocean, and we see the warm water foraminifera, well, we know, okay, that means the water was warmer, and we can probably make a reasonable assumption that there was probably a period of glacial retreat. Okay. However, if we're in the same location and we suddenly see that the, the foraminifera have changed to cold water foraminifera, well, that tells us there's a period of glacial expansion, causing the temperature in that area, causing the temperature in the ocean in that area to decrease, and so the cold water foraminifera make an appearance. So you know, that one is all relatively straightforward, and a classic example is an, a foraminifera called uh, Globetalia. And that's a, a that's a cool water foraminifera, okay. And so no wait, sorry. Uh, during the period, uh, sorry. 
And I do apologize. I always get that bit mixed up. So Globotella is a warm water foraminifera. So what we begin to see is we begin to see that during periods of uh, global cooling, remember that temperate band moves south, and that means the equator gets squished. So uh, Globotella all of a sudden finds itself in a smaller and smaller area. So we find its distribution actually decreases as the glaciers get larger. Sorry about that, I got very confused there for a second. So then we have coiling. So coiling will change depending on the water temperature. And actually another uh, species of uh, uh, Globotella will do exactly that. So depending on the water temperature, it will coil one way, and then if it gets colder or hotter, it will coil the other way. So for in this instance, if the water temperature is warmer, it will coil to the right. Okay. So essentially that tells us the water temperature must be in excess of 10 Celsius. If it coils to the left, it tells us the water temperature must be cooler than 8 to 10 Celsius. So once again, although not giving us firm numbers, it gives us great information, doesn't it? So depending on the cool direction, it must be greater than 10 centimeters. If it coils the other way, the water must be cooler than 8 to 10, cent 8 to 10 Celsius. So that's pretty good. That's a very useful bit of information to know. And then finally, when it comes to water temperature, we have the oxygen isotopes. So of course, oxygen comes in three varieties, oxygen 16, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18. Now, oxygen 18 is the heaviest. Okay, it contains two more neutrons than oxygen 16, so it naturally weighs more. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that when our water evaporates, so when your seawater evaporates to go into the atmosphere, the heavier oxygen is naturally going to be more difficult to evaporate. So water molecules containing oxygen 18 are going to be more difficult to turn into water vapor. So that means when you when you essentially begin to you know, uh, when you essentially begin to uh, vaporize seawater using using heat energy from the sun to produce a gas, well, that means the gas you produce is going to be much much richer in water molecules that contain oxygen sixteen. So that all makes sense, doesn't it? Now another thing that happens is is as your you know as your clouds begin to move northward. So remember most uh, evaporation of water vapor tends to occur in the tropics and then those clouds will tend to move in a northerly direction you know essentially pushing that water vapor northwards now the, ex the next thing that happens is, is as your cloud of water vapor begins to move northwards well it's going to start to cool down isn't it and as it cools down those water droplets are naturally going to start coalescing together and they're going to form raindrops now, it just so happens that when you start to form raindrops, the oxygen 18, sorry, the water molecules with oxygen 18 in them naturally want to form raindrops. Okay, they, they are preferentially wanting to form raindrops. So that means as your water begins to cool down and it begins to form raindrops, well, that means the raindrops are going to be richer in oxygen 18. So not so your cloud to begin with was richer in oxygen 16 and as it starts to rain that strips out even more of the oxygen 18 so your cloud becomes even richer in oxygen 16 and so as that water keeps moving northwards and you start you know you lose more and more of that water vapor to rain essentially your cloud becomes more and more and more oxygen 16 rich and so eventually your cloud makes it to the uh, the poles where the water vapor begins to fall in the form of snow and you know, sleet and other things like that. Well, that precipitation is going to be very, very oxygen 16 rich. And so during the last ice age, that, you know, that, that snow, that ice was incorporated into the glaciers. And so glaciers are very naturally oxygen 16 rich. Because of course the glaciers also, and the other thing the glaciers do is they hold that oxygen 16 in them in the form of water molecules and the, which are locked in ice so because glaciers are very very oxygen 16 rich what we see is when there are periods of glaciation we see the amount of oxygen 16 in the oceans go down 
and comparatively we see the amount of oxygen 18 go up. And so that tells us that there's a period of cold weather. We see the amount of oxygen 16 in animal shells go down and the amount of oxygen 18 go up. And remember though, we can only do this on relatively recent materials, so relatively recent shells. If the shell is too old, the shell will have been mucked about with during the process of lithification and other things, and we won't be able to get solid data. So the oxygen isotope data is extraordinarily helpful to us. The one thing it doesn't do though, is it doesn't give us a solid number. It just simply says the water was cooler, or the water was warmer. That's all, that's all the information we get. Okay, so do you know what? we've actually just covered that entire thing, so we're not really going to worry about that. You know, you know, obviously, you can take a second and read through it in your own time. Okay, so this is a perfect time to actually stop right here. So uh, once again, stop the video, get up, have a walk around, get a glass of water, tea, coffee, and then come back when you're ready for the next part.